Today we're looking at the second series of plagues, and we're going to continue to move through Exodus. We've got four weeks looking at the plagues, and uh, this is a, a recap from last week. We had a couple different uh, key ideas that came out. Uh, we were looking at the plague of blood, where the Nile was turned to blood, and then all the frogs that came out everywhere, and then the gnats or the lice, and there was a few lessons. One of them is there is real true supernatural power, but none of it is any match for God. Spiritual warfare is legit. It is real. There is a spiritual kingdom around us that we can't see, but it is fierce. There's no one like our God, and God's power is unmatched over anything else. So today, as we get into the next series of plagues, we're going to see how God sets apart his people and preserves them from what's happening to the rest of Egypt. So this is going to cover flies, lovely, livestock that were destroyed, boils on the people, that's uh, like an infection on the skin, and then the plague of hail. And our key points today are God's people are truly set apart, and he does this in order to protect them from his wrath. Okay, and that's a, that, that's a key distinction we're going to make as we work through this, because it's not protecting you against consequences. It's protecting you against his wrath, against sin. And then God sets his people apart. God doesn't compromise. And, you know, the point here is with human kings that are bent on evil, but God doesn't compromise with anybody. You know, God's will is going to be done, period. And then fearing God's wrath is not the same thing as salvation. Okay, so that's kind of a scary thought that we're going to uh, unpack a little bit. So key point number one, God sets his people apart from his wrath. Let's pray one more time as we get started, because this is going to be action-packed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we are just humbled looking at the the, the scripture coming alive uh, inside of us and all around us as you reveal through your Holy Spirit uh, who you are and what you want us to do. I ask that we would leave each Sunday different and that what we learn from your word would cause us to be more attuned to what you want us to do with our lives. Lord, as we look around to the world around us and we see the, the prophecies of Revelation beginning to stack up and prepare for what will not be peace in the Middle East, but will be the coming of a war between the armies of the north that cross the Tigris and the Euphrates and come against God's people. We know that there will not be peace, but Lord, we ask for time. We want temporary peace. We want time so that more work can be done to bring more souls to you. Lord, bless the time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, somebody want to read to get us going here. Exodus chapter 8, starting in verse 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, and when Pharaoh goes out to the water, stand before him and tell him that this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so they may worship me. But if you will not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies upon you and your officials and your people and your houses. The houses of the Egyptians and even the ground where they stand will be full of flies. Okay, just note that God's reference is constantly to his people. And that is something that is uh, recurring. They're not the Pharaoh's people, they're his people. Let me get rid of something here. I opened up Telegram, and so now it's uh, generating. We'll kill it. Okay, going on to the next slide. But on that day, I will give special treatment. So what is that day? What is that day? The day the flies show up. Okay. 
On that day, I will give special treatment to the land of Goshen. Where's Goshen? That's the land that he gave to the Jewish people, his brothers. Yeah, so for 400 years, the Israelites have been living in Goshen, that northern part of Egypt on the, the Nile Delta, where it's very fertile and they've got cattle and herds and goats and sheep. Their, their livestock are all up there with them. And they're completely separate from the city centers of Egypt. Where my people live, no swarms of flies will be found there. In this way, you'll know that I am the Lord. I am the Lord in all the land. I will make a distinction. This is now all of a sudden different from everything that's happened so far. Because the plagues, historically, so far, have affected everything, the entire land. But now God's separating his people. See, we could easily, even people do this today. Uh, historians will say, well, there was, um, there was a, 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 probably a large flood uh, of, the, of the Nile and that uh, caused the frogs to, to, to you know, go out everywhere. And that could be explained by you know, natural phenomena. And of course, when the water receded, the frogs were stranded and then they dried up. And then that caused the stink and that could be explained. And then of course, the stink brought the flies because there's rotten frogs everywhere. So this is all explainable. Okay, we, we have people that try to explain away Old Testament events like this today. So God's saying, okay, I'm gonna take away all your explanations for these phenomena, and I'm gonna make it so, it's kind of like if you've ever been in a cloudburst where it's like raining here and it's sunny here. There's flies here and there's no flies here. So th this is now a huge distinction. Somebody keep on reading in verse 24. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses of his officials. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies. Okay, so we talked one time as we were getting started in Egypt about how We've got all these different parts of this story are like a metaphor where Pharaoh is like Satan and Egypt is like your old life. It's your sinful past. So what's Goshen? What would that be a metaphor for? New life. Yeah, it's where, it's where they were set apart. It's, they're distinct there. Now, it, it, it feels like God's patience is, is running out uh, where he's just saying, okay, I'm not going to give you a chance. If, if you don't let my people go, I'm going to you know, bring another set of plagues. Uh, why is God so patient and why is God triggered? Any thoughts or comments on that? Hint. What's Pharaoh's attitude? Who does Pharaoh think he is? God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not forget this. In the context of what's going on, the Pharaoh's families are worshipped as deity. And all of these other gods are subservient to him. That's why he's got magicians that can control all these different things so that they can show the people that, yes, I have power. And so for, for Moses to come and say, the God of everything demands that you let my people go, Pharaoh's thinking... What are you talking about? I'm God. So how does God keeping the Hebrews from the plague point us to something about Jesus? Making you think. You won't have the wrath of God okay. if you follow his ways. Yeah, yeah. So it, not, not rocket science. You have the wrath of God being poured out on all those who reject him. And those that are not, uh, they're not like destroyed by wrath. They're only the people that have decided they're going to follow the Lord. I think it's a grace. You know, Jesus came. Yeah. Um, 
one because of his father's story. He knows that because he got a copy of the PowerPoint slide. <laughs> yeah, Philippians 3, uh, verse 18. Uh, because God's not different from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We can see who he is throughout all of Scripture. For I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Do people live as enemies of the cross of Christ today? Absolutely. And their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame. So the, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, those are their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. So we as Christians... We're living amongst enemies. Would you agree? Yeah. Okay, we are in a foreign land. We are living amongst enemies, but we are supposed to be set apart the same way the Israelites were set apart in the land of Goshen. That's a physical separation. Today, we don't have a physical separation. One day we will, but at the moment, we are mixed in. Just like the Israelites were mixed in with the Egyptians in their culture, we are mixed in now. And we are living amongst enemies of God. But we're citizens of heaven, according to Philippians chapter 3. Somebody read that verse from Philippians 3. can't wait sounds great but God proves his love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible because there was nothing we did while we were still estranged from him therefore since we've now been justified by his blood how much more shall we be saved from wrath through him there's this repeating theme all the way from the Old Testament, from the beginning in Exodus, all the way to the end, that we are preserved from God's wrath. So last night I thought our table was going to get into a pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib discussion. Uh, and that's a fun conversation because you've got conservative evangelical Christians in all camps. And they can go to Scripture and they can say, yeah, we are not spared from the tribulation. Or, nope, we're going to be taken out in the middle. Or, nope, we're pre-trip. I mean, it is an interesting conversation. And if you grew up believing one thing, it is super interesting to look at all the other ideas. But there's a theme that we see in Scripture continuously, and that is God preserves his people from his wrath. So if we believe the great tribulation in the second you know, half, the last three and a half years is going to be God pouring out the bowls and the trumpets and the judgments on earth where a third of the skies are darkened, the third of the stars fall, a third of the, the oceans are destroyed. That does not sound like something God is intending to pour out on his people. So it, it's a theme we see that this world is the enemy's kingdom. Satan is the prince of this world, according to John 12, 31. Okay, so let's take this down to kind of some application. Uh, why do you think it's important to talk to people about God's wrath? Because we're all accountable for God. But, but, but why don't we just share the love of Jesus? Why do we have to talk about this stuff? Hell and wrath and because punishment. It's kind of like a parent. Okay, God explain. Is, well, like... <clears throat> If you do if you do good you're rewarded. If you do bad, you're punished. Okay. And so sometimes the punishment is out of love. It's not necessarily meant to be mean and evil. Mm. And maybe, you know, it something have you ever noticed that when you get a punishment you get like a little jolt of, Oh my gosh, maybe I shouldn't do whatever, whatnot. That's what like, I'm Yeah, I, I've heard kids say that if if they grow up and their parents never punish them they feel like they were never loved enough to be cared for or to be put on the right path. If you let a child do whatever they want and they inherit consequences all along the way, how can that be love? Just be a permissive parent, let them do anything. Um, but we're not talking about just guidance and correction. We're talking about the wrath of God where it is an end unto permanent destruction separation from God forever. Why is it important to talk about that? Well, you know, like you, if somebody has cancer, you need to know so you can get it treated. Mm -hmm. And so you just say, okay, but you want people to be able to avoid God's wrath, so you say, hey, you know, this is showing the way to avoid it. Yeah, it's like the same. 
saved their life if the fire de- fire department or the firemen drove down the street and saw a house on fire and they knew the people were in there, <coughs> they're going to go out and try to save them. I had I had somebody challenge me one time to to, to think about all the people around us. Go to the shopping mall. Go you know any public place. And if you could see them the way Jesus sees them, if you knew everything about all those people, you would see, oh, that person's name is John. He's single, but he's had multiple girlfriends, and he's never accepted Jesus, and he's suicidal because he's never, ever found a loving relationship. Oh, and that person's, that's Amy. She's in a marriage that is broken, and her life is just a wreck and she's going to hell because she's never ever been introduced to Jesus. Oh, and that's Arthur. That guy over there, he's in line. He's going to hell also. His circumstances are a little bit different. He's got cancer. It's third stage. He doesn't even know. And nobody's ever talked to him about Jesus. Oh, and that person over there and that person over there. And if you look around, majority of people don't have salvation. And if we had that vision that Jesus has omnipotence of being able to see everybody and everybody's circumstances, we would see that people are not talking to other people honestly. We're we're, we're not doing what Jesus did and confronting sin and sandwiching it with the love of Jesus. So we're in a fallen world and God's got us here to make a difference. We are supposed to be salt and light. Let's go on to point number two. God doesn't compromise with anybody bent on evil. I'm going to help. I'm going to help out a little bit here. Um, I'm going to cover this section over here. So yeah, this section is God doesn't compromise with human kings who are bent on evil. Am I hearing? Oh, oh, there we go. All right, so who wants to read this verse over here? Let's see, the key point here is God doesn't compromise with human kings who are bent on evil. Exodus 8, 25, um, the next couple of verses in there, starting at 25 through 26. Who wants to read that? Go ahead. Then Pharaoh, son of Moses, and Aaron said, Go, sacrifice to God within this land. But Moses replied, It would not be right for you to ask us if the sacrifice that we offer to the Lord our God would be detestable. We offer sacrifices that are detestable before the Egyptians. Will they not stone us? All right, great. Thank you. So, you know, this is actually Pharaoh's first attempt. You know, he, they've, they've gone through all these different plagues, you know, the, the, you know, the flies and the blood, you know, the, uh, Moses and all these things. And finally, you know, Pharaoh's finally starting to think about, well, I've got to do something. You know, he can't, he can't put up, something has to be done. So he decides to throw out kind of a compromise to Moses, permitting the people to offer sacrifices to their God within this land. And it wasn't so much the idea that the Jews were offering sacrifice that would have been offensive to the Egyptians, because Moses objects to that. He says, you know, this is not going to be tolerable. You have to remember that the sacrifices of these people were, were bulls and lambs, and that was detestable. For one thing, the Egyptians had a god, they had many, many gods, and one of their gods were bulls. So that would have been really, really offensive. Sheep and bulls, that would have been off limits as far as the Egyptian people. They would have thrown a temper tantrum, and they would have really stoned these people for doing that. So that was off limits. And that's why Moses said, hey, that's not going to work. So who wants to read the next couple of verses over here, um, 27 and 28? We must make a three-day journey the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commands us. Pharaoh answered, I will let you go and sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. Now pray for me. All right, great. <laughs> so Pharaoh goes a little bit further. So first, of, you know, the first compromise was, you know, you could worship. Now he's saying you could go a little bit further and allows them to sacrifice to the Lord in the wilderness but still falls well short of what God is demanding, right? You could do this just as long as I still have control. Just as long as you don't go too far, 
um, but I'm not going to release you. You're still going to be my slaves, but we'll give you a little bit of lenience over here, um, and, and that would be fine. So he, he offers a little bit of compromise just as long as he maintains control. And then he asks Moses to intercede for him in prayer. And the reason he does that is he's at the point right now that he recognizes that his music, magicians and all his advisors are not going to be able to stop this. There's nothing he could do. That nothing that anybody on his team is going to be able to do to stop these plagues and to stop what Moses is doing to, this, to, to them. So he, he does recognize that. Um, he's beginning to recognize that Yahweh... Um, is a god, it may not necessarily be Pharaoh's god, but he's recognizing and he's finally recognizing that Yahweh has uh, some, a tremendous amount of power and um, he's willing to make some compromises to be able to, to deal with that. Okay, who wants to read Exodus 29, please? Pharaoh must not act deceitfully again by refusing to let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Okay, great. Thank you. So Moses agrees to pray to the Lord to remove the flies. And he also warns Pharaoh. He says, don't be deceitful and go back on your word. So what do you think Pharaoh is going to do? Do you think he's going to be faithful to what he says? How many people believe that? I don't think Moses believed it either. So we know that that's not going to happen. So let's see what happens next. So then it says, and this is a short a couple of verses here. Then Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses requested. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh and his officials and the people and his people. No one, no, not one fly remained. But then it says, as we could expect, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and this time as well, and he would not let the people go. So Moses, he upholds his part of the bargain, right? He says, I'll pray for you. He prays for him, and God is faithful. Not one, all those flies, not one little fly. I wish I could pray and have, I have a fly problem in my backyard, especially in the summer. I wish I could pray and, and get rid of all the flies. That would be great. They come in my, my kitchen. It's really annoying. That'd be great if God would eliminate every single fly, but he did that for Pharaoh. So Pharaoh should have been really, really grateful, um, but he wasn't, and he does not keep his word. Uh, so who wants to read the next couple of verses? This is chapter 9 now, 1 and, one and this, I guess, verse 1. Wow, it's getting serious. I mean, this is really getting serious because a lot of those previous uh, plagues, like the river, it killed, you know, when you turn the Nile into blood, that killed a lot of fish, but it didn't really cause any detrimental damage, permanent damage, and some of these other ones. But as, you, as we keep going, these, these plagues get worse and worse. All right, then it says, but the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that no animal belonging to the Israelis will die. We have that, what we're talking about earlier, that separation, that grace that he's giving to the Israelis, but that's not available to Pharaoh and the Egyptians because he's hardened, the leaders hardened their hearts. Who wants to do five, verse five is next. Who hasn't read before? Go, go for it. The Lord set a time saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did just that. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. All right, great. So, you know, they're talking about the livestock, and that symbolism in here is really, really important. If you were living in Egypt and, you know, the livestock, when that's economically, that's critical. 
But the fifth plague um, is very potent because many of Egypt's gods and goddesses were depicted as livestock. So he's really mocking their gods. You know, there's this god called Buchus. That's a sacred bull, and, that, and he was worshipped. Sometimes bulls were considered to embody the gods of uh, Tau and Ra, but the chief bull, his name was Apis. So you have this chief bull who had a name called Apis, and at the temple in Memphis, <coughs> priests would maintain a sacred enclosure where they, would, they kept um, a live bull, and they considered that the incarnation of this god, this boar god called Apis. So that's what they really believed. Um, when the vulnerable, let me see something here. I'm not sure if you can see me. I got a little bit more. There we go. When the vulnerable died, he was given an elaborate burial. Archaeologists have discovered they found these funeral niches for hundreds of these bulls near Memphis. You've got funeral, you've got cemeteries where you've got hundreds and hundreds of these bulls that were worshipped. Um, so, you know, so really there's this, so there's a lot of things that they, that they really, really believe. So this whole thing about the livestock was really, really um, a big thing for the people of Egypt, not only economically, but also spiritually as well. All right, verse 7. Who wants to do 7? Pharaoh sent officials and found that none of the livestock of the Israelites had died. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Could you imagine how, how upset he must have been? All my livestock are dead, and, and then you have these people that are causing all this. Theirs is alive. He must have been just enraged. That He must have been just furious with that. And I think probably that anger, I, I imagine this is just my speculation, that he must have been really angry about that. Uh, because, you know, where's his gods? Why can't my gods take on his god? So uh, probably a lot of jealousy. Uh, so the plagues go from bad f for, to worse. The first plague killed the fish and harmed the harvest. The next two, the frogs and the gnats seemed to come and go. They didn't really have a permanent effect. But with the flies... You know, the text tells that the land was ruined. The flies were devastating. It ruined the land. And then the fifth plague really hit hard. All their livestock, you know, was, was a lot, of, you know, was, would die. You know, if they, if they, there was a provision where if they kept the, the livestock indoors or sheltered, it would live. So there was some that survived. But it, it, it didn't kill every single piece of livestock, but it killed a lot of them. Yet Pharaoh still, after all that, was, his heart was remained hardened. He still would not yield. Yeah, it hasn't affected him personally yet. Yeah, that's a great point. It hasn't. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And it's not until his anger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. When the people got the boils, did it did it stay on them permanently? I think probably when he prayed, it probably eventually oh. went away, I would assume. Yeah. I, mean, I hope so. <laughs> um, so who wants to read verse 6, please? Verse 6. Go for it. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the furnace in the sight of Pharaoh. Moses is to deposit it in the air, where you come find dust over all the land of Egypt, and such be boils will break out on man and beast throughout the land. Wow, this is pretty devastating. <clears throat> so they took the suit from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air, and festered boils broke out on man and beast. It was everybody. The magicians could not stand before Moses because the boils had broken out on them and all of the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to them just as the Lord had said to Moses. God knows our hearts. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what's going to happen. You can't hide anything from God. Um, so the sixth plague is a little bit different. So it's delivered, this time it's delivered without any kind of warning being given to Pharaoh. 
in it also involves dust becoming a pestilence. So, you know, God figures, look, this guy's constantly hardening his heart. I'm not going to give him a warning. He's had enough warnings. This is, you know, this is it. However, this time the Lord did not have Aaron strike the dust with his staff. That's different. He ordered Moses to grab a handful of dust from, the, from a kern and toss it into the air, which then became boils upon both man and, and beast. So it seems kind of likely that the suit came from the very kerns that the Israelis used to make bricks for the Egyptians. So God is issuing a very just judgment. The Egyptians had broken um, and blistered the skin off the Israelis, and they beat them you know, with rods. They whipped them with bricks. So this is like, you know, you know the Bible says, you know, vengeance is mine. I'm the Lord. It tells us, don't, don't you take vengeance. There's going to be a certain t- point in time where I will carry out justice. And that's what God is doing in this situation. He's, he's being just. Um, and they're suffering the consequences. Um, so here's a couple questions. How did Pharaoh try to compromise with God? How did Pharaoh try to compromise with God? Mm-hmm. Sure. Did God did, did God tell them that He wanted them to be released for for sacrifice? Is that what God actually said? Say again. I'm sorry. Is that what God said? Did God tell them um, about sacrifice? God did. But Pharaoh actually. Said. Yeah, Pharaoh said that. Yeah, <coughs> exactly. Any other ideas? What did what what else did how did how did Pharaoh try to compromise with God? I think you got it. I mean, he just he said, okay, you know, a couple a couple things. One, he he said you can sacrifice, you know, <coughs> for three days, you know, in Egypt and outside of Egypt. That was really about it. Um. So. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go. Wait, did I go the wrong way? Okay, I went the wrong way, sorry. In what ways does the word try to convince you to negotiate with evil? Does the world. In what way does the world try to convince you to negotiate with evil? How does the world do that today? That was then. That was Pharaoh. This is today. How does God? How does? How do they do that today? Yeah. Well, I think he attacks our weaknesses, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone has certain vulnerabilities, <coughs> right? My, what I'm vulnerable to might be different from someone else. Right, so God really strikes us where we're weak. Some people might, f- you know, feel free with discourage, you know, struggle with discouragement. Others with alcoholism. Others with porn. There's all kinds of things that we vu- we're vulnerable to. That's why this thing over here, you know, life recovery is something to really consider, you know, getting involved in, you know, because we all have vulnerabilities, and we all we're all susceptible. So God will, Satan will tempt us, and the world will tempt us in any multitude of different ways. Um, but the thing of it is God wanted to set them free to worship him. And for Pharaoh, it's all about, you know, for, you know, for him personally, it was really about control. And he, was, he, he wanted political power. He wanted slaves. He wanted authority over, the, over the slaves. Um, so that's, that was a huge thing for him, for, for him. And for other people, control might be a big temptation for some people. How can believers practically walk through the battles that come our way? <clears throat> How could we walk through the battles that come our way? What do you guys think on that? We have to realize it's not really our battle to give it to God to, to fight for us. Mm-hmm. So it's putting our faith in him and put him on our armor in the morning. Yeah, for sure. 
I think just the, 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 the main things, you know, spending time with God on a daily basis, you know, you're doing that. If you're spending time with God, you know, just setting aside a few minutes, you know, every day, you know, con- you know confessing sin, fellowshipping with other believers, <coughs> studying his word are, the, are, are great tools that we have available um, to, to deal with those kind of things. That we that help us to in turning things over to turning things over to God, um, you know, really powerful ways. He's given me some very powerful tools. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark. Yeah, this section from from point number two is, is so impactful because you know if we consider that Satan is like Pharaoh, Pharaoh is like Satan. Satan's constantly trying to get us to compromise, and like. You can go to church, just don't serve. Like, you can go out, but don't go that far, Pharaoh telling the people. Um, Pharaoh seems to have some type of an appreciation for God's power, but it is not fear of the Lord the way God's demanding. And there's a difference. Exodus 9, verse 13. Someone read. So there's a reason for the plagues so that everyone will know there's no one like the Lord, Yahweh. Continue. So visualize that message being presented directly to Pharaoh. I have raised you up. I have raised you up for this purpose so that I might display my power both to you and that this story would be proclaimed throughout all the earth. God's patience is wearing thin. Behold, at this time tomorrow, I will rain down the worst hail that has ever fallen on Egypt. From the day it was founded until now. So give orders now to shelter your livestock and everything you have in the field. Every man or beast that remains in the field and is not brought inside will die when the hail comes down upon them. That sounds like Dallas all hail. (laughs) Yeah, you know, in Texas, we can uh, really appreciate golf ball and softball size hail. Um, You know the destruction that can occur, right? So, this plague is a little different now. And you know, we see this recurring theme of grace, like Steve mentioned. God's still showing this like, tidbit of grace in the middle of this plague because he's telling them, look, you can spare yourselves, you can spare the destruction, just get your livestock and your crops, get everything out of the open because it's going to be bad. So, God gave them a chance. What's interesting is, well, look what happens. Somebody read verse 20 and 21. Thus among Pharaoh's officials he feared the Lord, for the Lord heard to bring their servants and livestock to shelter. But those who disregarded the word of the Lord left their servants and livestock in the field. So there were some amongst the Egyptians that got the word and said, oh my gosh, Based on everything that's happened so far, we're not going to put this at risk. We're going to shelter our livestock and our herds, right? But this isn't worshiping God. This is fear. Okay, there, there's a difference. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant in the field throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and lightning struck the earth, so that the Lord rained down hail upon the land of Egypt. So, again, this is impacting everything. The hail 
fell and the lightning continued flashing through it. The hail was so severe that nothing like it had ever been seen in all the land of Egypt from the time it became a nation. So we can only imagine how extraordinary that would have been if you'd never ever seen hail before. Someone continue reading. Throughout the land of Egypt, the hail struck down everything in the field, both man and beast. It beat down every plant of the field and uh, stripped every tree. The only place where it did not hail was in the land of Goshen, where the grain is blue. So once again, we've got the Israelites being spared from God's wrath, and it separates them. It creates this huge distinction. Someone continue. And what do you think the, that Moses thought when Pharaoh said, okay, this time I have sinned, the Lord's righteous, and my people are wicked? What do you think Moses was thinking? I don't trust him. Yeah, right. Moses said to him, when I have left the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord, and the thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you will know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your officials, I know that you still do not fear the Lord our God. <clears throat> we could talk a whole Sunday about just this concept of fear. What did Pharaoh fear? The destruction of <laughs> Yeah, more destruction. Was that the same as the fear and reverence of a holy and almighty God? So Pharaoh's just operating lip, lip service. He's wanting to get what he wants. He just wants the hail to stop. And that does not mean that he's actively changing his heart before the Lord. So this is an interesting parathetical phrase that comes in in the next verse. Now the flax and the barley were destroyed since the barley was ripe and the flax was in bloom. So some of the crops were destroyed that were already growing. But the wheat and the spelt were not destroyed because they are late crops. So again, God demonstrates grace for this group of people in that he didn't destroy all of their livelihood, only the plants that were already growing. But everything else that was in the ground and still in germination phase because it was a late crop, that was all protected. So grace again. In in interesting to see God's absolute uh, vengeance and his anger and his wrath, but at the same time, this grace. And a lot of times when we read this story, we don't see both sides of that. Then Moses departed from Pharaoh and went out of the city and spread out his hands to the Lord. The thunder and the hail ceased and the rain no longer poured down on the land. Someone finished reading this. When Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and thunder ceased, he sent again out of his heart ten of his officials. So Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. So didn't the Lord say, Moses, I'm telling you, Pharaoh's heart's going to be hard. He's not going to let him go, right? So do you think Moses is surprised every time this happens? <laughs> He's probably thinking, gosh, Pharaoh's kind of expletive, just crazy. Um, None of this took Moses by surprise. But more importantly, it didn't take God by surprise either. Okay, God knows what's going on. God told Moses everything that was going to happen from the very beginning. Remember a few weeks ago at the burning bush? Everything was laid out. It was like a full chapter, full of instructions on what was going to happen. Hello? God knows everything that's going to happen, even when there's tragedy, destruction, terrible events in your life and the life of people around you. God knows. So how do these plagues identify the difference between those who fear the Lord and those who did not truly fear the Lord? How did the plagues show the distinction? Actions speak louder than words. Okay, so you have a behavior that is different, and then God's response to it is different. He spares one group, his wrath, 
The other group gets the wrath, but he still shows grace in the midst of it all. How, does, how did Moses know that Pharaoh didn't really fear the Lord? How did he know? Pharaoh's got a pattern. He's got a history of lying and deceitfulness and not um, following through on his word. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How? Why? Why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? Because human, humanity in and of ourselves will never be able to figure it out. We'll always go in the wrong direction. There's so many examples of this. You know, you have, you know, human wisdom makes people think there's multiple gods, that you have these bulls that are really gods. They believe <coughs> in, in fake gods, and they set up these images, and they say, this is God. And then they believe that men can become women through these sports. It's just, it's endless. So, so can we agree there's a difference between being afraid of what God might do to you Versus having a fear and respect and reverence for the Lord God. Yeah? Okay. So are there more people who love, respect, and fear the Lord God Almighty? Or are there more people who just fear what God might do to them? Okay. So if, if people believe in God, then there may be a, this fear of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm at his mercy of whatever's going to happen to me. Yes, people, you know, just, hey, do you believe in the afterlife? You know, where are you going to go when you die? Boy, that opens up all kinds of stuff. And people frequently say, hey, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, I hope I go to the right place. They don't have confidence, and they don't know. They just know that their destiny may be in the hands of an angry God. And that's their perception. So how do you talk to people who need salvation when you've got this story of God is a God of wrath, but God is also a God of grace and mercy also. How, how do you share that with people? Do you just do the hellfire and brimstone message? Or do you just share, you know, seeker-sensitive stuff? I share, like, life things and how he's done to bless me in my life, even though I'm not the most blatantly Okay, so you use a personal story. Yeah, that's the, you know. Okay. Somebody else. Can we separate these two messages? Yeah. Sin separates us from God, and the opposite of being in Him is hell. Permanent separation. Yeah. yeah. And then we get the good news, and we say that God provided a way that you wouldn't have to go to hell. So I'm going to close with just a quick anecdotal story. Um, I, I get to watch my daughter Paige, who has this gift of evangelism, also, and she just talks to everybody, like in the parking lot at Walmart and in the the store, shopping line at Kroger, I mean, everywhere. And um, we've had on our prayer list um, a gentleman to pray for, a co-worker of hers. Uh, let me introduce you to Eric. Uh, pretty dark dude. Um, a very difficult past. And uh, Paige has been very direct with him. You've got eternal separation from the Lord if you don't accept Christ. But if you do, you have grace and mercy, salvation, and everything to gain. Hello? And it's not sugar-coated. It is, this is the reality. This is the reality. And he, he seemed to have be listening and paying attention. And over time, he was kind of impressed that Paige didn't just have a story. She lived it with her, her, her attitude and her, her actions. And, and that was getting to him. Because her, her personal testimony was echoing her statements and um, he, he quit and she kind of lost track of where he went and 
this, she got this message just a couple days ago, literally a couple days ago. Paige, I just want to thank you for shining his light. Not sure if you remember my skate church friend. He's referring to a, a guy by the name of Blade, who's an evangelist to skater dudes. He goes around to skateboard parks and preaches the gospel to kids and young adults that would never ever hear otherwise. Um, but he literally showed up during one of the darkest times of my life when I was getting ready to give up and get back on heroin. This was about two weeks ago. Blade shows up and he decided he was gonna stay at my house with me since Monday. Before he leaves, we're going to have a little ceremony at a park where I'm gonna rededicate my life to Christ. Again, I thank you for always being an example of his love. It stuck with me more than you could know. So she did her part, and then God used this other guy to step in when he was at rock bottom. We don't know how our testimony is impacting other people. You have the truth. Time is short. Let's go back to the very first few minutes of this conversation. We are seeing revelation set up for the end of days right now. Time is short. Let's make the most of it. Dear Holy Father, Lord, we come to you and ask that you would convict us through your Holy Spirit of the things that we need to change in our own lives, that we would be willing to be useful vessels in your hands, that we would be moldable and used for your purposes and intentions. Lord, we want to receive the blessing that comes from being used by you in other people's lives. Lord, we want to take this truth of wrath and grace and take it to the world. Lord God, I ask that we would be open to see those opportunities around us with family and friends and that we would be different again when we leave here today. Bless the rest of our time together, our lunch, our fellowship, and our worship time. In Jesus' name, amen.